Welcome back to Espresso and Kabbalah. Happy Thursday. L'chaim. Cheers. L'chaim. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Well, my son's birthday is Sunday, so that's exciting. Many is turning four. Um, and I know, he's so big. Yeah, a year ago. Um, L'chaim. Mm. So every time we make a blessing on our coffee, we're doing something good, right? Because we're bringing Hashem into this moment. We're channeling the divine energy and appreciation and any stresses that we may be going through <laughs> in our lives. Um, like they say, big T traumas or little T traumas. There's all sorts of things that happen to us and, you know, get in our way. We get in our own way sometimes. Circumstances, they're not always easy. They're not always, you know, the road is not always smooth. And when people write letters to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, they're always writing for blessings and prayers that this should go well in my life and my health and I need a blessing for this or that or someone I love is going through you know, just all different situations that people would write about for advice and guidance. And the Rebbe's blessing would oftentimes say, you should be blessed with success, which is without any obstacles or blockages in your path. And I think about that when a blockage comes up in my path, that that's life. You know, we're meant to have blockages on the road and we're meant to like work through them and our job is to pave the way and make it a smooth happy joyful journey and it's the biggest blessing we should all have a smooth road and we shouldn't have obstacles or difficulties but when they Life do come up not, <laughs> not at all the cheers to that <laughs> perfect imperfections and by the way i'm not being here next week because i'm in new york yeah. oh new york <laughs> well, I am. that's cool safe journeys yeah, um, Awesome. Um, we're going to New York for my brother-in-law's wedding at the end of the month, um, the engagement party for Mendel Namjar mm -hmm. to Shayna Edelman from Paris. Um, they're getting married um, before Passover. So Where are they getting married? In New York? In New York. So that's exciting. We're getting yeah, all dressed up and you're all welcome to come celebrate the wedding with us. It's <laughs> going to be an epic Hasidic wedding in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> um, you're invited. So it'll be special. L'chaim. L'chaim. May we only know Simchas. May we only know Simchas. Amen. May with this war end, and we should have only peace in our inner lives and for the world. Just no more craziness. No more crazy. Uh, only good news. <laughs> only peace. And praying for everyone who is going through difficulty at this time that they should get out of the country if they need to get out of Ukraine and they should be safe and the Jewish community should be safe and the world should not experience any more hardship and pain and suffering. Um, amen, amen. Amen, amen. So talking about the Lubavitcher Rebbe is such a perfect segue into today's Espresso and Kabbalah mm -hmm. lesson. We're on page 122 of the Practical Tanya. The Tanya written by the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Liadi, adapted by Rabbi Chaim Miller. And on page 122, we begin chapter 10. What is chapter 10? It's called the Tzaddik. So throughout Tanya, we have this kind of structure. Maybe I'll draw it out so it's like easier to see. Do you think that would be helpful? It's like kind of a diagram. <laughs> so you have the I'll write it in Hebrew and I'll explain. Okay, so here there are three categories of people in the Tanya. This is Tzadik, it's cursive in Hebrew. <laughs> the middle is Benoni, which is the in-betweener that we discuss, and the other side is Rasha, the wicked, so to speak, person. And the Tanya says that anyone who does any evil action, one word of gossip, one forgetful moment of not thinking about, you know, you know, just like anything that's against God is automatically a rasha. And it's not that we are wicked, it's that we can have moments where we're imperfect and then moments where we transform ourselves into the benoni, the in-betweener 
can have in-between moments. So it sounds kind of like, what do you mean? Like, I'm not wicked, I'm, I'm an in-betweener. The in-betweener is actually at a very high level because he has perfectly mastered his thought, speech, and action. So think for a moment, can you control your thoughts? Remember we talked about this for 60 seconds. Just positive thinking, just pushing away negativity. We can if we try, maybe, right? Can we control our speech for 60 seconds? I mean, we could duct tape our mouth shut. That would be pretty easy. <laughs> so that's doable. And can we control our actions for 60 seconds? Like, not harm anyone or do anything mean for 60 seconds or go against what Hashem wants. We can buckle up in a seatbelt and just stare. You know, we can do it. It's, it may, so we can control, even though it may be extremely difficult, right? Action is easier and then speech and thought. We can control our impulses, even negative thinking, we can control for a short period of time. And in that period of time, where we are in self-control, self-mastery, and we're like not just running after impulse desire, impulse, impulse um, like whatever is sparking our whims, and it's called the benoni, the in-betweener. We have mastered our thought, speech, and action, and now we're at the level where our, our external reality, our libushim, our garments, are a hundred percent expressing godliness. So right now we're sitting and studying Torah. We're in a Benoni moment. We're in a moment where every faculty is just being who we're meant to be: being kind, being godly, being helpful, being good to ourselves and others, making this world a better place, being happy. Anytime you do a mitzvah, you are at a moment of external perfection. So why are we not a tzaddik? Why are we not this good guy on this opposite end who's totally perfect, right? A tzaddik is like a godly man, like no sin ever. Nothing ever crosses his lips that's like not godly and kind. So the reason why we're not a tzaddik is because the tzaddik has done something very unique. Within the soul of the tzaddik, there is zero struggle. We can't even imagine never having a negative emotion rise, never having a negative impulse desire. He has slaughtered and conquered his animal soul. He's just godly. He's just a godly person. And we can't really, it's not our job really to be that because God chooses specific special people in each generation. And we'll get to that. We'll touch upon it later in the text. There's something called Sadik Yusod Olam, which means a righteous person upholds the generation. They're like pillars. You know, a building, this beautiful marble structure, like going to Rome and seeing the like Colosseum and all those beautiful places. We see big, beautiful pillars, right? Where some of the homes here on Singer Island have these gorgeous like Roman facades, like those pillars in the front. A pillar upholds a structure. My question is, even a godly person, mm -hmm. you're saying even a godly person doesn't have negative thoughts? You mean, even though he's a person? Like, how could he not have negative thoughts if he's a person, right. like a human being? It's a great question, and it's not very, like, common. It says that there are 36 hidden tzaddikim in every generation. Like, of these people, they're, they're very few and far between, and they were given a gift by Hashem that they were able to overcome or were born without a negative um, soul, like, without a negative impulse. Now, we're going to discuss... An, little more detail what that means, but we're going to remember that our job is the Benoni. What's the difference of the Tzaddik and the Benoni? The internal soul of the Benoni will struggle every day and every moment of his life. He's going to have something rise up and subdue the urge. He'll maybe want to get angry, but he won't allow angry thoughts, angry thoughts to enter his mind. He'll maybe feel a temptation to do something that he's not allowed to do or is not the right time or place but he won't act upon it, he won't speak it, he won't think it, he will control with perfect, and in the moment of Ubenoni, we can be that person in a moment of control to have complete autonomy and agency over our actions. So that it's too stressful. It's, it's a lot, it's a kind of, it's a very like, how can this be um, doable or in reach? And the Altar Rebbe encourages us throughout the Tanya, he says, this is very close to you. Just reach out and take it. Just You don't have to feel like you're stuck with 
you know, just running wild after wild thoughts and wild feelings and desires and emotions, you have so much potential to master your emotions, to really, even if we feel stressed, to say, you know, I was reading and studying about anxiety a lot, and I heard this great podcast about talking to your anxiety. Hi, anxiety. I see you. You're here. Um, thank you for notifying me about the danger and the pain that you're trying to keep me safe from. Um, I'm actually safe, thank you, and I'm loved and I'm happy and I'm doing okay. I don't really need you to flood me with anxious desires and feelings and thoughts right now. I'm, I'm good, but thank you. <laughs> kind of like a friend who is so well-intentioned but maybe a little misinformed and anxiety comes to help us out and gives us like this whole trip that we don't need. So that's a fascinating study of just how to like maintain calm and not let anxiety overrun our lives, which it happens to all of us. Like I get waves of anxiety and depression whenever anything stressful happens. It's about how we deal with it and how we kind of, can we stay positive and joyful and optimistic in the moment and, you know, utilize our inner power. So the Alter Rebbe gives us a lot of tips and tricks and strategies. Um, and today is an interesting lesson about the tzaddik. So what does the presence of a tzaddik do for our generation and do for our world and what is their job and how is it different from our job so l'chaim <laughs> we should all merit to have a lot of success in everything that we do and joy and positivity and only good things cheers so it's important to note that this is about certain levels and jobs not necessarily certain people but um, the tzaddik. Any questions so far before we get in the text? Or we're good to jump in? Okay, let's jump right in. So far, so far, the Tanya um, has given us a tour of the psyche, describing the animal soul, the divine soul, and their conflict. So last week we said, there's a war, there's a battle, there's a struggle. Like they're constantly trying to win over my faculties, over my body. So now that we have some familiarity, we're like advancing here, guys. We're like next level. <laughs> we're like already deep into the Tanya and we're getting to interesting conversations beyond what we've discussed before. Um, so now that we have some familiarity with the soul's architecture, the Tanya will begin to address a number of questions which remain unanswered from chapter one. Uh, what is the difference between a complete tzaddik and an incomplete tzaddik, right? A tzaddik comes from the word tzaddik, which means righteous, holy, just, pious, like in general, excuse me, anyone who goes after the ways of Hashem is called a tzaddik. You know, if someone does something kind, I'll be like, you know, we'll, we'll say, oh, you're a tzaddik, you're an angel, like, you're, you're so amazing and righteous and kind. Like, that's what we say when someone's just so incredibly kind, right? Tzaddik. Um, what is the difference between a complete rasha and an incomplete rasha? So rasha means a wicked person, right? Someone who is letting his animal desires take over at that moment. Um, and then another question. If a benoni, right, we said this middle guy, if he never transgresses, how is he different from a tzaddik, right? So they look the same. Someone who, a tzaddik actually looks the same as someone who's in control. And then how is it possible for a tzaddik, such as Rabbah, to mistakenly conclude that he's a Benoni? So this goes way back to one of our first or second or third lessons where we talked about Rabbah, and he was perfectly godly, and he said, I'm an in-betweener. Um, so this is like a lot of interesting, detail-oriented kind of texts and questions. Um, why did Job Eov say that God created tzaddikim, which seems to violate the notion of free choice, right? So a tzaddik, if he's created godly, is, is he, does he have free choice? You know, what happened? Does he still have the opportunity to choose God if he's automatically choosing God, right? So he is... Yeah, he has, a, he has a totally interesting kind of job in this world. Um, of course he has free choice, you're right. So finally, this will lead us to answer the Tanya's opening. Choices. Yeah. 
um, the Tanya's opening question, why was your soul made to swear an oath? Remember our soul swore before it came into this world? Be a tzaddik and don't be a rasha. So every one of us, before our soul came down into this body, our soul swore, I am going to be righteous, I'm not going to be wicked. I am going to live my life for Hashem in a godly way. So that's like innate. And it's like every time we do something like kind and helpful, we feel like that's me, right? Like I, I, that's me. And the reason why we feel like that's me is because it is us. We are so good inside because we have a godly soul that promised to be godly. So that's like the healthiest expression of who we can possibly be is to follow in the ways of kindness and righteousness in the ways of Hashem. So if you fall off, what I, I'll use the word, if you fall off the wagon, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you've really had a bad day and you've been ugly to somebody, somebody's really upset you and you've really been ugly to them, so then you fall into the other category, right? So we mess up. We out. always make mistakes, and that's part of the Tanya, is how do we deal with our mistakes, right? What can we do to make them right? What can we do to fix them? And maybe we fell into the wicked category for a brief moment, but the second that we right that wrong, and we say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I was wrong, and I, I hurt you, I, I, you really try to not do that again and you commit to being better in the future we've up the we're next level we're we're in the in-betweener stage already so sure we can mess up and we can fall into you know off the wagon for a moment but we can always get right back on and that's the gift of this book the altar Rebbe is saying hey just because you messed up once or twice or a hundred thousand times that doesn't mean that you're gone like you're not labeled and stuck in this category forever. That's the Russia. You're totally capable and it's within your power and within your spirit and strength and soul to just jump right back onto this side. All you have to do is make the conscious aware choice and say, I intend to be who I really want to be. And I love this with kids, especially like all relationships with ourselves, with our partners, with our children, our friends, family, everyone really it just applies to everyone there's no such thing as too late to go up to someone and say even if it happened ages ago or yesterday or five minutes ago you can always go up to someone and say i was thinking about it and i i can i try that again like i didn't mean that because we're never stuck in the past so that's why we're in betweeners because i can be great to everybody else but there's one person that five months ago, I did something I shouldn't have done. So for the most part, I'm not quite the tzaddik, but for this one person, I'm a rasha. So that's why I'm an in-betweener. No, yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> did you follow that? Did I say that right? I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I get what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, probably on the same wavelength. She's, um, <laughs> no, she, she's way above it. Not at all. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh my gosh. I like mess up every other minute. Um, seriously, we're all like trying to just be good people. But so, like, somewhere if in the back of your head, it's like, okay, I probably should really apologize to this person. Yeah, but it's never too them. late. They're not good with apologizing over the phone. Well, that's the so thing. <laughs> Judaism knows that about us and, and says, hey, and, you don't know, people. It's COVID, yeah. so I'm not going to visit anybody. And I don't know. So that's what makes us an in betweener because well, you can't. Yeah, well, we have Yom Kippur, right? <laughs> so Judaism knows that about us and says, hey, here's it's that so time. You can do it over the phone. Yeah, you can. I mean, look, that time of year comes around and it's like, this is the moment that if that person you were thinking about really needs an apology, now is time to give them a call. <laughs> Honestly, that's the thing. I mean, that's the beauty of Yiddishkeit is it knows us. It's not trying to expect or demand ridiculous uh, standards of perfection that we're not meant to achieve. And that's what today's chapter is all about. There's perfection, which is a tzaddik. That's not our job. This book is called Sefer Shalbeinu Name, the book for in-betweeners. It says it right here. It doesn't say the book for perfect word. people. I love that word. It's, it's a book for us. It's a book for people who try. 13, 17. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Sorry. No, it's so funny. It's so true. Like it literally is a like life. It's a <laughs> real deal life. Like every single day, just everyday challenges, everyday joys and triumphs. This is life, and like this is a book for in betweeners, not perfect people, not <clears throat> angels. It's a book for us who get on the wagon, fall off the wagon, run after the wagon, <laughs> climb back on the wagon, hold on to the wagon, the wagon for dear life. <laughs> Maybe the wagon is like, we can't even see it, it's so far down the road. <laughs> We're running, trying to find, calling, GPS, locating the wagon. But that's exactly... That's the time with the perfect person. Uh, even though he's holy right. and... Oh, this guy in chapter 10? We're going to discuss him because he's an interesting character and is not um, the everyday job of people in this world. But we need them because they inspire us. They, these perfect godly people, they remind us of who we truly are on the inside. When we see a tzaddik, it's like our soul is looking in the mirror. And our soul says, that's who I'm supposed to be like. A person who's kind and godly and empathetic and sensitive and caring. And it just pops out of our like neshama that desire to be good and to be just and fair and just like do good things because we have tzaddikim in this world to emulate and look up to and follow and we're so blessed to have a tzaddik. We read in the Chumash every week about Moses and the Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov, the forefathers and King David and all of the leaders and the Rebbeim and the teachers and we look up to them and we say you know, thank you for leading us, for guiding us, for being there to answer our questions, to inspire us to serve Hashem, to rekindle our faith, to rekindle our, our own inner leadership in our own lives. So we're not them, <laughs> but we could like try to be them. people is they all made mistakes. Right. And which, which makes it easier for me to look up to them mm -hmm. because they were flawed people. And, and that's okay. Like it shows you that when you fall off the wagon or lose the wagon, you're not bad. 100%. And like, it's, it's important know, to have like, those relatable stories so that we can like kind of follow along. And if we read the Hasidic interpretation of a lot of those stories where it's like oh, that holy person in the Bible, like what do they do? And a lot of the Hasidic deeper interpretation following like Chabad philosophy, is really showing us how it was God's will and they are on the right track. So there's always a, a bright side to look at and a positive way to look at things. And by the way, that's a mitzvah in the Torah. Have Adam the kol Adam lekaf zichut, which means have every person before you with the benefit of the doubt. Because we're meant to have the benefit of the doubt for each other. Like we can all be interpreted as trying to do the right thing or trying to do the wrong thing. And if we look at each other and say, you know, he or she really meant to be kind or well-intentioned. I can see where that was coming from a good place. And when we give each other like slack, like it's okay, then we're able to give ourselves the gift of slack. And it's okay if I messed up, I can jump back on and have a perfect benoni moment. I can have that in-between moment and I can look at the people around me and say, hey, just because you messed up 10 years ago or yesterday, I can still respect you and look up to you because it's a new moment. Every day is a new creation and you can make new choices. We're so free. So the beauty of this book is the freedom it gives us. So we're never trapped, never labeled, never stuck in circumstance or pain or difficulty or challenge because we can always make the choice to rise above. As difficult as it may be, we can always make that inner choice and each of us live in our own body, so I can only tell myself the things that I know I need to hear in the calm, compassionate, kind, confident language that I need. And you live in your body, and you know what you need to tell yourself to, you know, to rise above and be your true, like, unencumbered self. Um, and it's so beautiful how the Tanya just opens the door for us and says, hey, you're never stuck. The, we can always have a positive attitude and a good spirit and a joy in living life and serving Hashem because, hey, it's never over. You know, as long as we're here, we can make the world a better place. We can take, you know, every moment and give it our best.
So l'chaim. Um, and now is your opportunity to think about anything that you know you want to kind of like make better. You can really, really do it. You, you have the strength. You have the capability, the inner like worthiness to make your life like amazing. Um, so that deserves a l'chaim. <laughs> Cheers. I feel like we're saying l'chaim before we even read the Tanya like 10 times. <laughs> so let's read a little bit about what it actually is, says about this tzaddik, this person, this angelic person. Um, so the solution to all of these problems on the middle of page 122 will hinge on the Tanya's two-layer description of the soul. All here? Got it? Yeah, which contains a deep core of ten powers that determines your attitude and desires, and two, a more superficial layer of three garments that control what you contemplate, say, and do. So this language is probably familiar to us already, right? What's the deep core? The ten powers, we have the ten spirot, the intellectual capacities of chachma, bina, da'as, the emotional attributes, right? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. And then Chesed, Gevura, Tiferas, Natsach, Hayed, Yesar, Malchus, which are all the emotional attributes of endurance and splendor and harmony and the rest, bonding, foundation. Um, did I miss any? Kindness, severity, harmony, Chesed, Gevura, Tiferas, Natsach, endurance, Hayed, splendor or humility, um, Yesar, foundation and bonding, and Malchus, royalty, like kingship. So all of these emotions can, like, they're the core of our soul. And then there's the garments, which are what we contemplate, right? Thought, say, speech, and action. <laughs> so let's go into what this means. Okay? We will begin section one, the incomplete tzaddik. We will begin with the definition of the incomplete tzaddik. In chapter one, we concluded that every tzaddik, complete or incomplete, is devoid of an impulse to evil. So the obvious question here is, if a person's impulse to evil has completely gone, why would we call him incomplete? So in our diagram, the tzaddik guy over here, the good guy, there are two of like types. There's the incomplete tzaddik and the complete tzaddik, right? So, um, let's say it's like, like a pie chart, I guess. So, this is the pie chart. <laughs> the complete tzaddik, the pie chart is full. Like, he's completely godly. Completely, like, devoid of negative desires. And the incomplete tzaddik, I shaded it, like, I left a tiny little chunk, like 95% complete, and a teeny little sliver of maybe some negative desires and impulses. But the thing about the incomplete tzaddik is he can be 95% godly, or it can be a pie chart that looks like this. It's like But if he's holy, 90, how can he only be 95%? Or he can be 95% like unholy desires and only 5% completely godly. So this is the incomplete tzaddik. He can range from 1 to 99% incomplete or godly. And then the tzaddik that's complete is 100% godly. Okay? So 1 to 99, he, his, um, his, this guy's animal soul is like completely transformed to godliness, 100% transformed. And this animal soul is almost transformed. So either it's a tiny bit transformed to God, like one little piece of the pie is godly, or almost the entire animal soul is godly. So it's like either 1% of it is transformed to godliness or 99% of it is transformed to godliness. But when he completely turns it over, he goes into the 100% category of the complete tzaddik, not even a smidgen of negative impulse rising. And that's the godly soul of the tzaddik. And the animal soul of the tzaddik is like 
annihilated. We're gonna go further. <laughs> okay, we'll explain. It gets a little like technical, but when we get the anatomy, right, we've all gone to biology classes, <laughs> anatomy classes, right, chemistry, physio like physics. When we discuss like the anatomy of something and we pull apart the pieces of the puzzle and we say, this is that, this is that, then we can like put it together and have like a picture of what's going on. So the Alter Rebbe gives us this like dissection of the soul <laughs> and in different scenarios how the soul looks. So we can totally like, like it can translate into our lives being super easy to navigate when we know the inner workings. Um, Vihine, Parak Yud, Parak Chapter 10 of Tanya. Kisha Adam Magber Nafshai Ha'elikis, Vinilcham Kalkach Im Habahamis. Now, when a person strengthens the influence of his divine soul and wages war against the animal soul, and now we're reading the altar of his words, Ad Shemegaresh Umevair Hara Sheba Mechal Hasmali. So he has waged war. Remember the war with the king's clashing swords? They fought the animal soul, and he managed to expel and eliminate its evil from the left chamber of his heart. He is now a tzaddik. So the two kings fought, and one guy won. The good guy won. The enemy is gone. He's 100% conquered his heart, both sides of his heart. Now godly territory, right? <laughs> the war is over. As we learned in chapter 9, page 123, the passions of the animal soul take initial expression in the left side of the heart. Remember we said, like a dog, like a loving, loyal puppy. Like we're, when we're full of heart, it's like the blood is just passionate and running after Hashem or running after passions. Whatever it's running after, it's passionate and emotional. So we're energized blood is found and it fuels its passions. And that's kind of how we mostly operate. We, we run after our emotions and we try to make our emotions for Hashem. This individual has achieved an impressive degree of self-mastery to the extent that his animal soul no longer harbors any desire for self-gratification. So this guy who conquered his heart, he's not here for himself anymore. He's like, he wakes up in the morning and instead of his physical body waking up and saying, I have to go to the bank, I have to, you know, take care of my car, I have to like to fix my to-do list. Instead of being like a physical self-gratifying human, he wakes up and his body says, good morning, I am a channel of the divine. What can I do for Hashem right now? Like it's completely, the physical body is there, but it's kind of how we're all meant to wake up, right? Good morning, Modani, I'm here for Hashem. So the tzaddik has accomplished this. Kemesha kasev uviarta hara mekir bacha. And as the verse states, you shall eliminate the evil from your midst. So it says in Deuteronomy, in the, in the book of Devarim, it's a commandment. We're meant to knock out the evil in our lives. So this verse speaks at the literal level of the commandment to eliminate a false prophet from the Jewish community. So don't have toxic evil, um, don't, don't allow toxicity into your life. Um, yeah, water to counteract all this rasso. <laughs> I always like to have some water with my <laughs> poison. You don't, you don't, you still have that one. I have water in this one. <laughs> Cheers. A double dipper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're meant to eliminate evil. Don't allow evil in your life. So this is a, a commandment of actually eliminating evil. But the Tanya reads the word mekirbecha from your midst hyper literally and you shall eliminate the evil from within you. From your midst, mekir becha, from your innards, from your, in your soul, eliminate the evil, implying an ethical imperative to achieve self-mastery. Don't allow evil to, to reside in your heart and in your mind. Knock it out, like with your weapon of choice, you know? Take a, a, a what are those things for fencing called? like those fencing swords, right? <laughs> a, a, uh, with a J, I'm forgetting. It's not a javelin. Something. Um, <laughs> Take your weapon of choice and <laughs> knock go. out the evil. 
Um, that's a mitzvah. It's a commandment from Hashem. So anytime you're questioning, by the way, like, should I just let this evil thing slide into my life and whatever? Or should I make active strides to knock it out? This here is your message for the day. Take active strides to knock out the evil. If something is negative in your life, take active, proactive action. I said that three times. Take action <laughs> to get it out of the way because there's no place for evil in a Jewish, happy, wholehearted life um, or non-Jewish, just serving God and being a good person. There's no place for evil. Um, the ain hara na lamish. Yet, if the individual has achieved an impressive degree of self-mastery, Right? He's in the pie chart and he's self-mastered a lot of his soul, but not all of it. The evil has not been completely transformed to good. Nikra tzaddik she'ena gamar v'tzaddik viralai. He's classified as an incomplete tzaddik or a tzaddik who has some bad in him, like it says in the Talmud. So the ideal is if we slaughter the evil impulse and it's gone, Next level is we slaughter some of it and we keep fighting it and there's some left, but we keep trying to knock it out. Um, so would the average person be an incomplete Sadiq? It's a great question. Would the average person be an incomplete Sadiq? And we're gonna see if it's possible to actually, for the mere mortal to like yes. kill this animal drive. Is it possible? Let's see, we're gonna find out. Um, so the Tanya cited the Zohar's definition, in the Tzad who has a bad, the bad within him is suppressed by the good. Now we will explore this idea more in depth. Dehainu, the middle of page 123 in the Hebrew and English. Dehainu, that is to say, Sheyesh by adayin na'at nizer mizer ra b'chalal asmali. That is to say, there still remains in the heart's left chamber of the incomplete Tzadik a minuscule amount of evil. Ela she'kafav u'bata latayv me'ch only being such a small amount it is suppressed and voided by the good so there's so little um, bad in his in his soul because he conquered most of it and it's like all subdued so that tiny little bit it might as well be complete it's like this is so that, he's at the, I don't like, know, my pie charts aren't so clear. Like that tiny little bit that's left in the side that he didn't conquer is like, might as well be complete because it's like so, he did so much work. Sorry, <laughs> my book is falling. He did so much work to conquer it and now there's just a tiny bit left. So there seems to be no evidence of this small amount of residual evil. Consciously, this incomplete tzaddik only loves God. The way he looks, like, you would never know about that smidgen of evil in his soul because his thought, speech, and action, perfect. Like, 100% godly. You wouldn't know about the inner struggle and subduing negativity that keeps rising. You would never know it. He only loves God in spiritual pursuits. The physical world and its temptations have lost their allure for him. His evil has been voided. Okay, he's, he's good. So it's Velachain Nidmalai Kivayagar Shehu Vayelachlai. And that's why he imagines that he's driven it away and it's gone from him. Like it says in the Psalms, Kule Legamre, all of it completely. Abalbi MS truthfully Ilu Khala Fahalachlai Legamre Kalharashabai. But in truth, if all of his evil had entirely left and departed, Hayanaha Pachlataif, it wouldn't merely be absent. It would have been converted to a positive force, to goodness, mamish, literally. So it says, the animal soul is part of you, and you cannot rid yourself of it, right? We have a divine soul, we have an animal soul. We're always going to struggle. It's there. It desires all the time. You can influence what it desires. Remember, we hold the reins. We can steer the horse. Hey, don't desire cookies. Go desire praying to God by directing your mind to either spiritual or physical pleasures but you cannot stop it desiring. It's like, how can you stop a beautiful stallion from running after its feelings and passions? It's impossible. It's always going to desire. We can try to navigate which way it desires and try to refine its desires and say, oh, okay, you don't desire, like kind of when we refine our diet. Oh, instead of craving donuts, we crave spinach, right? We can elevate what we crave and wish for, but we're always going to have desire and passion that's how we're wired 
So there's two um, like this strategies. This applies to the tzaddik also. Like yeah. A complete tzaddik still has that desire. The complete tzaddik has zero animal desire. It's co it's it's slaughtered. It's subdued with the fencing. But it's still javelin. there. He just doesn't <laughs> notice it. It um, he just automatically. The, so uh, there, this is what I'm rate. exactly. So this is what I'm saying. There's two different levels in the Tanya. Two strategies of conquering darkness and negativity and evil. The first strategy is called iskafia, subdue. The second strategy is called ishapcha, which means transform. So you know when we subdue negativity, we push it away. The other way is to transform it so there's no negativity anymore. That became good, right? Um, trying to think of an example of this but like we can say oh I don't want ice cream like subdue the desire like I already ate dinner and I'm full and I want to go to sleep or we can transform it and say like that desire is no longer there and the desire is just for what I really want like it's not like I'm pushing it away it's gone it, it's transformed so the tzaddik it's not like he's subduing his desire his job is a completely different job he's busy transforming the darkness in the world to light. He's not just pushing darkness away, he's actively like transforming the world into a light and godly place. So we can always like employ these two strategies because we have a passionate animal soul that has impulses and can rage and love and live and feel things, joy and all these great feelings. Um, remind everyone to come to Shabbos to hear Zachar Amalek. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. A reminder for special service on Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. at the Chabad house. Um, so we're saying you can't stop the animal soul from desiring, but we can like subdue the desire or try to transform the desire. Um, different strategies. <laughs> this book is full of tips and tricks. Um, in an, should we keep reading a little more? Page 124. In an incomplete tzaddik, right, the conscious desire for physical pleasures has departed, and he appears to have completely transformed his animal soul for the good. But the departure of these desires is deceptive. In reality, his animal soul has not been transformed to good. If that were the case, we would find a greater passion towards positive things and a more powerful rejection of the negative there's still a residual indifference to evil. So let's explore this idea, Uber HaInyan. Basically, what it's saying is a tzaddik who's like only for Hashem, he is like on God's page. I love what Hashem loves and I hate what Hashem hates. It's like a very transparent. Have you ever seen those purses that are like loose sight, like clear crystal? You can see what's in the bag. Like, you see, you know, the lipstick and the ID and the keys and the phone, like, it's clear. So for the tzaddik, imagine he's like a clear receptacle for godliness. His soul is godly. The animal soul is slaughtered. It's completely for Hashem. And, and he's transparent. Everyone looks at him and they see if Hashem hates, you know, evil speech, he hates evil speech. If Hashem loves you know, beautiful mitzvot, and we put tefillin on men and light Shabbat candles, like, that's what he loves. It's like a clear, direct, like, visual of what God wants in this world. And the, if we have, like, the clear bag, and we see inside the DNA of the soul, the incomplete tzaddik, you see that instead of just loving what God wants and hating what God hates, he has, like, that little evil in him is just kind of like apathetic, like a little distant from, a teeny bit like distant from caring what God cares about. In a, in a very like, remember this person looks perfect. You would never know. We only know because we have the secrets in the, in the Tanya, but you would never know the DNA of the soul and what's going on. We just know that he has a little struggle. So we'll read the explanation inside on page 124 of chapter 10 in the Tanya. Kihine um, tzaddik gamur, right? Now with a complete tzaddik, the guy who's done. Shanea pacharashalai letayv, whose evil has been transformed to good. Belachi nekra tzaddik letayvlai, which is why he is referred to as the tzaddik who has it good. Who alidei hasaras habagadim hatzayim legamre mehara. 
He has achieved this through completely removing his evil soiled garments. What are these soiled garments? Um, with, as we explained, emotional detachment from worldly pleasures is a necessary step to transforming the animal soul. So someone who like just indulges in chocolate cake, like literally loves the pleasures of this world, not for Hashem, that's just like random. Like Batania is like, no, like you should do it for Hashem. He is repulsed by the pleasures of this world. He only wants for Hashem. So the notion of enjoying mortal pleasures purely to gratify the body, um, not in the worship of God. So he says, it's not for Hashem. Like, I don't want it. It's not for me. So... What is the practical lesson on this page? Who wants to read the practical lesson aloud? The hallmark of a complete transformation of the animal soul is A, to be utterly repulsed by evil or even the notion of self-gratification, and B, to love God even with your animal soul. Okay, so we have it made. <laughs> um, a soul that is totally for Hashem, there's nothing for itself, right? It's like... Were you we're, reading from 124? 124, yeah, yeah the practical lesson. Right. Well, here, practice. <laughs> it took me a minute to figure out what you were talking about. <laughs> the practical <laughs> lesson, to love God even with the animal soul. So we're like, <laughs> we're looking at a person who is so, 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 so godly. Um, and it says that he detests anything that's from the other side due to his profound love for God. Page 125, um, with an exceptional love that is great and pleasurable mentioned above. Uh, we just want to point out someone, oh, Sarah wrote Mazel Tov on the Sefer, dedication, Sefer Torah dedication tomorrow. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, we're looking forward to tomorrow's grand Torah event where um, we are being gifted with a beautiful handwritten Sefer Torah and we're celebrating at the Marriott Resort at 3.30 p.m. tomorrow on Friday and it's rolling into a beautiful Shabbat with amazing food and hors d'oeuvres and dinner and desserts and music and dancing and you don't want to miss it so see you there. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning. Um, what are we saying here? Why must the complete Sadiq utterly detest Klippa and Sitra Akhra? Like, one second, like, isn't Judaism like about love and everything is good and we love and peace and no, that's actually not Judaism. Judaism is about godliness. And if Hashem created evil, we're actually meant to hate evil. We're not meant to be passively, peacefully loving our existence and just like floating along in space and having a good time. No, like it's there are godly moments of being active and standing up and being repulsed, as it says in the Tanya, by evil, by klipa and sitra akhra. If something is toxic and negative and coming from impurity, Hashem hates it. He doesn't want it in this world. We're meant to hate it. We're meant to fight against it. Yiddishkeit is about truth and it's about standing up for what's right and it's about doing the right thing even when it looks really uncomfortable or difficult. Yiddishkeit is about doing the right thing. So sometimes people have a conception of religion as like, oh, like peace and love, and that's actually not Judaism. Judaism is about being positive and proud and doing what we need to do for Hashem. So the tzaddik is for Hashem, and he, he loves God very deeply with a great, profound, pleasurable love, but he utterly detests klipa and sitra achra. He is you know, just to, will not have anything that's against Hashem. Why? And I'll wrap up today with this idea. Because God has made, and this is one of like the best lines in the Tanya that gives us like, it's just such an amazing line to me. Like it helps me so much in my like everyday life. So I'll tell you a little bit about why it inspires me. Lachaim. So it says, God has made one opposite the other. There's always like an equal counterpoint. There's no spiritually neutral zone. If you love God, you will detest anything that opposes God, any act.
that is from Klipa and Sitra Achra. Kitech Sev, Tachla Sina Senesin La Ivan Hayuli Chakrini Vida Levavi Vagama. As the verse states, I utterly detest them. They have become my enemies. Probe me, O God, and know my heart, etc. King David asked God in the Psalms to probe his heart. Do I utterly detest the enemies of God? Love of God and contempt for that which opposes God are inversely related. So, zeh le'uma zeh asa elakim. Right, I'll go back to my diagrams. <laughs> this is always equal to its counterpart, right? So, imagine, you know, you have love of God on this side and heartbreak on that side. <laughs> and they're equal. It's like a seesaw. So, not a seesaw, but like if one is very great, the opposite is very great. If I have, if a, if a tzaddik has such a great love of God in his heart and his love, the love here, <laughs> if his love is flying to the heavens and anything that Hashem wants from him is just like over the top joy, like sukkahs, build me the nicest sukkah. I want the best lulav and etrog. Matzah, I want the crunchiest, most handmade, purified, amazing matzah. Um, davening, I want the most beautiful, incredible prayer service in a beautiful synagogue with a nice talis and siddur and music, everything, the best. For Hashem, I love Hashem. The most, the most, the best. Shabbos, give me a beautiful white tablecloth, gorgeous dishes, amazing food, a feast for the eyes, a feast for the soul, for the body. Everything Jewish, the best. Godliness, love, everything, I want Hashem in my life. It's equal here. Anything Hashem doesn't like that gives God heartbreak, should have made like a lightning bolt. Anything that gives God heartbreak, all the way up there. I hate it. It breaks my heart. Any evil in this world, injustice, impurity, pain, I hate it so much because I love God so much. Does that make sense? So that's why Jewish people are such activists in this world. Like, we love Hashem, and we hate anything that's against Hashem. We're, we're equally like bound on both sides with our love and our hate for evil. So does that make sense to everybody? Imagine I love my partner. Anything that, that he loves, I love. He loves soccer, I love soccer. He loves, you know, like I love it for him. I want to make him happy. And if he hates something, I'm going to hate it too, right? Because I want to support him. If he doesn't like pink, I'm not going to bring pink into my house, right? Because I love him. Does that make sense? It's kind of like equal surges. So it's, it's, it's an interesting concept, but it really applies like all over the place. Sarah said, can we hate a person or just his evil acts? Um, so we don't hate people, but we hate evil. We hate evil. Um, that's a good, great question. We hate impurity. We hate the pain that's inflicted on others. Um, but every person has a spark of the divine and they can always choose to do good, right? We don't, um, like the Egyptians, we don't hate Egyptians for hurting the Jewish people in Egypt. They could have chosen to not hurt the Jewish people, but they did. So they drowned in the Dead Sea, in the Red Sea. We don't hate people. We hate negative actions that people do. But um, thank you for that question. <laughs> Any other questions about this concept? Zel or does that does that resonate? Zel asa elokim. Right. Imagine you love your child. Anything that like you, and if you love them, you will detest anything that opposes them. A person in this world so also like if you're really um, gifted at something like if you have a very strong strength of um, cooking right you can cook and feed people and do a lot of good with that strength or you're really good at cooking so you can I don't know 
be evil with that strength as well somehow. <laughs> Anything that we have, we can use for the good or for the opposite. Like the power is equal on both sides. Does that make sense? Like we can use our gifts and our intuition and our abilities for any direction that we choose. It can skyrocket on either side. Cool? So that's like basically the, the template of this concept. Um, so what did King David say? And we're on the last section of page 125, right? See, the rule is in the middle of this page. Ukefi arach gaidel ha'ahava lahashem kach arach gaidel hasina lesitra achra um vehamitos berabatachlis. The rule is directly proportional to the level and magnitude of your love for God will be the intensity of your detest for the sitra achra and your sense of complete repulsion for evil. So let me just clarify, we don't hate any one, of course, we love all people, every person is good inside, but we hate the, the evil, like the um, absence of Hashem in this world, we hate the, um, the negativity, the, the lack of place for Hashem, we're repulsed by the space of like the bad stuff, so let's make that clear. So detesting is like abstract klipa and repulsion is tangible klipa but if a person has achieved complete transformation of his animal soul um, his loathing of and repulsion for evil will be as powerful as his love since repulsion is literally the opposite of love of god as is detesting so it says if you detest the idea of smoking because it is damaging to your health you will you'll the whole experience is going to repulse you it goes together um, and, and we're going to turn the page in the next time to discuss how to love God and bring love of God into our lives. <laughs> so this is a bit of a detailed discussion of like levels of people and levels of love and levels of this and that. But when we discuss a tzaddik, we're saying this is a person who's manifesting God in this world. And even though very few individuals are like this in history, we can love the fact that they're here because they hold the world up and we can learn from them and we can learn how to truly be our best selves. So next after this chapter is chapter 11 called the Russia, which is the wicked person. <laughs> and we're going to see what he's all about. So it's very interesting, fascinating stuff. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to Kabbalah with a sip of espresso. <laughs> Cheers and have an incredible, successful, joyful week. Thanks for tuning in.